on the Talkback Show, on the radio, or whatever audiovisual device you choose to use, welcome to the GBC Podcast, where we talk about the Packers and our hometown of Green Bay. This is episode 14, created April 27th, 2022. I'm John. I'm in Appleton, Wisconsin. Along with me are Jeff in Minnesota and Neil out on the East Coast. Say hello, gentlemen, and tell us what you're drinking. Hello, everyone. I am having a uh, very colorful Mispillion River uh, War Llama in view of the war rooms that we all have for the draft tomorrow. So a War Llama, although I have my doubts, and this is my first taste of it. How it is looks it? like Gatorade and Miller Lite. Yeah, it's a little bit better than that. Let's just say that, but let's <laughs> not by much. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a that's an endorsement. <laughs> uh, good evening, gentlemen. I'm having. Uh, a little bit of a special treat here. Uh, Johnny Walker, aged 18 years. Excellent. And I am having a straight gin martini. Shaken or stirred, Mr. O Mr. Shaken John? Obvi Shaken, obviously, because stirred martinis are dumb. And if we're going to put an endorsement out there, I will say this is uh, Ryan Reynolds' brand of aviation gin, and it is excellent. All right, you can find us on YouTube and Twitter at Green Bay Chat and Facebook at the GBC Podcast, Green Bay Chat. And now just the audio is available on Spotify and Anchor by searching for Green Bay Chat. All right, tonight we're going to talk about our latest Twitter follower. We have some draft predictions to go through tonight. Our guest contributor who's going to be joining us, Alex Strofe of ESPN Radio Madison and fellow UW Stevens Point alum. And then we'll get to our Packer player of the past and, and our Packer history report uh, as well. But gentlemen, let's talk Twitter. Last week when we were making our show, I saw that a cool cat named Jim McMahon recently joined Twitter and he said he's going to start randomly following people. So I put a picture of uh, from our GBC podcast Twitter page. I put up a picture of Jim McMahon, the one that's up there, because that'll play well for the audio only people. I put up a picture of Jim. I said, hey, <laughs> hey, Jim, if you follow us, I promise not to post a picture of you in your Vikings jersey. And he followed us. And there's the proof right there. Jim McMahon is a follower and we'll say a fan of the GBC podcast. That's big news. Sure. Hmm? Neil, that ranks up there. You're, 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 we're, we're one of 7,000 people. I mean, you got to feel exclusive when Jim, you're one of the 7,000 people Jim, Jim McMahon follows. 7,000 is not a lot of people to follow, so that's pretty good. Well, and, being that and, you, just, you said he just joined Twitter, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we were on the front end of that train, right? Yes, we're, yes, we were, early and often. Almost as cool as the – actually, I would say it's more cool than the Andre Reid like that we got, right, Neil? Uh, that was organic. I'm I'm very happy with the Andre yeah. Reed. Uh, that just happened. We didn't ask for that. Yeah. So Jim McMahon, though, Jim McMahon was drafted fifth overall by the Chicago Bears in 1982. So that's the year before the big quarterback draft class of 1983. So 1984 is when McMahon was drafted fifth overall. They're really, I'm sorry, 82. Uh, there really wasn't anyone else quarterback wise <laughs> drafted in that class, but going to throw some impromptu trivia at you all right there were so jim mcmahon drafted fifth overall in 1982 after that there are four players from the 1982 draft class who are in the pro football hall of fame mcmahon is not in the hall of fame uh two first rounders a second rounder and a fourth rounder hmm. i'll give you the positions one's a guard one's a running back one's a linebacker and this should tip you off the fourth round pick is a kicker yeah. fourth round kicker taken 86 overall from michigan state draft drafted by the new orleans saints morton anderson morton anderson all right that's you got one down uh we'll go to the other easy one first round pick 10th overall running back from the university of southern california marcus allen no Drafted by oh. the then Los Angeles Raiders, oh. one Marcus Allen. Hey, yep. even the blind squirrel gets a nut. That's, I say that's probably the two easy ones. The guard, taken eighth overall out of Penn State, drafted by the then Houston Oilers, Mike Munchak. 
I was going to guess that one, John. You needed to give me a second. Yeah, Gee, come on. You know, I lived in, you know, I lived in Houston, so. Let's edit that back that in. Bad. Should we edit that back in for you, Neil? No, we're not going to. <laughs> All right, I'll let you guess on this one. All right. And the fourth one, Hall of Famer from the 1982 class, linebacker out of Iowa, taken 41st overall, second round by the New England Patriots, linebacker, Patriots. Let's see. He got his ass beat. He got his ass beaten in the '85 Super Bowl. That's all I know. <laughs> probably, he probably he did. Was, uh, William Perry ran his ass over. Andre Tippett. That was the hard one. We would have been here all night. Right. Point there being, you know, in the draft, anything can happen. You've got a kicker in the fourth round, a Super Bowl winning quarterback taken fifth overall. Uh, I think Mike Pagel was the only other quarterback of note in that '82 draft class. Wow. Yeah. So let's talk about the draft. We need to make a draft prediction because we're going to get this podcast out just under the wire for the NFL draft happening Thursday night, roughly 24 hours from now. At the moment, the Green Bay Packers have the 22nd and 28th pick overall. We kept saying that we're not doing a mock draft. Uh, We're not going to look at who we think all of the teams are going to take, but we have a very scientific method for determining who we believe or who we will predict the Green Bay Packers are going to take with their two picks in the first round. Jeff, what do you got there? A hat. I have a, I have a hat. What do you have there? Uh, Well, we have hats. We have hats. hats. And in the hats. We have, so our assignment, and this will give John all the credit here. So we did a little arts and crafts. Okay, so we had, uh, he uh, produced for us 12 scenarios. We almost certainly stole from other people. Scenarios is a good way to put it because it's not 12 picks. Right, scenarios. 12 scenarios. So based on that. And Neil, I I take exception to that, Neil. I put a lot of hard work into this. You searched 12 different mock drafts from other people? I did my, I did or my, did you, or, did you, or did you use like 12 different Mel Kuyper drafts because no, Mel Kuyper I, does I, 12 drafts. I mean, Mel Kuyper does enough mock drafts that he's got everyone picked in the right position in one of them. So yep. yeah, I, I, I Neil, yeah, exactly. I did. I do the background work for this show. I went to the PFF pro football focus website to their mock draft simulator. And I did well over a dozen of my own mock drafts just to see where players would fall. And I tried some with Packers trading up, trading down. I even tried some where I said, well, what if I pick as a different team and see what happens to the algorithm if I pick a goofy player here and there, see what happens. And the the predictability kind of worked out the same. And so I saw a trend there. Neil, you, you would like trends and statistics and graphing and charting where these players tend to fall. And that's kind of how I came up uh, with the, uh, the players that are on our sheets. And then putting them in at 22, 28, that became kind of random. Tried to make sure we didn't have two players from the same position and things like that. Can I pick? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We aren't going to say what the 12 options are, but Jeff, we're going to let Jeff make the first prediction. All right. With the 22nd. Ooh, I got a tasty one here. All right. I got trade up for, for Chris. Olave, that that Wide actually receiver, is Ohio that State. Actually, as of right now, Jeff, that actually is the one thing that I think is going to happen. Okay, <laughs> that, so that is no terrific. Sir Thomas. Yes, where? Uh, <laughs> how far up do you think they're going to trade up? I I think they I think they got to get ahead of Minnesota. I think that they have to trade up to where Washington is at eleven, if I recall correctly. Uh, they may have to trade the two picks, the two yeah, first round picks. Minnesota's not to get picking up. a wide receiver. They have Jefferson. Yeah, you never know. I, I just always feel like Minnesota likes to do things in the draft to really mess with Green Bay. But that's and and you're I not for other trade. words. I I don't think you're going to trade with Minnesota either. No. Uh, so that's why I like that. I like that number eleven spot with Washington, with with the okay. Commodores, the Washington. All right. Commodores. So that's that's the, where the we're football at. team. They're, they're always the football team. They are the football team. All right. So is it my turn to pick? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I am going with my lucky Preakness hat. So the uh, horse races are one of the things that I like to do. The Preakness is a. You had all the paper in there race. already, too. Oh yeah. yeah. And so I've got the Packers trading up for Drake London, wide receiver, USC. 
That's another good option. Wow, yep. we, wow. We, are, we are trading up the uh, big, big plans of the, hey, uh, the gods are saying trade up. I believe one of our guests, either Dusty or JJ, said that that's what they wanted. That they they would, I think it was Dusty last time. He said he would trade everything, <laughs> trade everything to get to get Drake London. He, London, he called him a Packer guy and everything. So I have my my Packer hat. Let's shake it, it up like, a bit. It looks like Will should or Will looks like Neil should be wearing like a blue suit with that hat. Oh, I've got a suit coat that goes with this hat too, and uh, nothing goes with that hat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would love to see let, the suit coat. Let me coat just tell you, you, horse, you horse, horse races are an entirely different experience. The uh, everyone goes. Uh, I wouldn't say dressed to the nines. It's always dressed to be goofy and showy, and peacocking is the order of the day. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And the Preakness is a good time. And it's all just gambling bullshit. So it's it's also fun. And that hat screams that yes <laughs> sorry john that's okay i love it so of the 12 scenarios that i created one of them was trade down mm -hmm. seven of them had player picks in the two spots and four of them were trade up and believe it or not we picked three of the four trade up <laughs> well what is yours say, what's yours i say green bay will trade up for george carlaftis edge rusher out of purdue all right, well, up that defensive line. I would say we've just set a precedent here. So it's it's a consensus that we say the Packers are going to trade up to get one of the premier players, someone that is top on their board that they want to get. We just have chosen different players out of well, our. I mean, there, there are certain draft analyses that are saying that there really are only like fifteen players that would in a normal year would be a first round uh, pick, and obviously they're going to be thirty two first round picks, and so. You either get one of the first 15 or you move back. And I, I think that there's a lot to be said for that. Although, you know, if everyone's trying to move back, uh, well, you're not going to be getting much for that. And if everybody's trying to move back, maybe you don't have to give up as much. You know, I guess uh, the thing about all three of those trade ups that, that I have there, I, I intentionally didn't say, you know, what we would give up and where we would go to. Jeff, you kind of put me on the spot there. Uh, but it's possible, yeah, maybe they trade their extra one and their extra two. Maybe they trade a one and a three. Um, I think trading the two ones gets them to the top 10, uh, the kind of playing with those numbers, the, the, the trade chart. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm talking out my ass right now because I don't really remember that was Saturday. And <laughs> as long as we don't do a uh, trade for with Ricky Williams type of trade, I'm okay. Oh, my gosh, right? Yeah, don't give up yeah. all your picks. No, I don't think that that. I'd like to think that that would never ever be done again, but there are a lot of there are a lot of desperate people. Yes, but we just read online an interview with Mark Murphy, Packer president Mark Murphy, who commented. He even said uh, that he thought if Brian Gutekunst, he thought that that he would be. Mark said he would be shocked if Brian didn't try to do some trading in the first round. So take that for what it's worth. You know, are you going to try to trade that? that 28th pick you're going to try to trade the 22nd pick you're trying to trade up trade down you know didn't specify other than to say hey those cards are there they're ready to be played well we'll we'll mark it in the books and we'll come back sunday night and see how we did so we're bringing in our honored guest for tonight his name is alex strofe alex is a host and producer with espn radio wisconsin he is also a fellow uw stevens point alum as mentioned earlier Alex, how you doing? What you drinking? Fellas, good to see you. Uh, one of my favorite beers, River West Stein from, uh, from Lakefront Brewery. Love it. Excited to drink it. Excited to have it over a great chat with you guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to see you, fellas. John saw you a couple weeks ago for the world's largest trivia contest. Now you did an episode uh, a little bit about that. So yep. uh, good to see you, fellas. Uh, Jeff, Neil, good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. So Alex, tell us where you are now. You mentioned, we mentioned Stevens Point. We both went through the, the uh, 90 FM studios at WWSP, easily my favorite room in the world to be in. Uh, <laughs> but you graduated from there, station manager, you did that job and you've moved on. You're in, in Madison now, you're statewide on ESPN, but what else are you doing? Yeah, so all sorts of stuff. So yeah, as you mentioned, I'm with ESPN Radio in Madison, uh, our sister station, ESPN Milwaukee, do some work for them as well. So right now we're recording, obviously, the night before uh, the draft. So draft Miss, Eze, draft Miss Eve, that's easy for me to say, clearly, <laughs> uh, if you will. But 
Uh, so currently producing and co-hosting a, uh, a daily show in Madison from 2 to 4 p.m. called Rutledge and Hamilton with longtime host Jim Rutledge and Olympic curler Matt Hamilton, who may be the goofiest man in the world, uh, but, but we have a blast doing that. He's over in Switzerland right now actually competing for the World Mixed Doubles, Mixed Doubles Championship with his sister. Um, so that's, uh, that's been fun to keep track of, too. I, I, I didn't know curling until I met him. So it's been uh, interesting to get into that one. But uh, that's, that's one project I'm working on right now. Also host a uh, mostly week, daily show uh, from 6 to 7 p.m. on both 94.5 ESPN in Milwaukee and 100.5 ESPN in Madison uh, called Bucks at Six here during the uh, Milwaukee Bucks playoff run. As we're recording, they're whooping up on the Chicago Bulls. So all good there as well. Uh, and then I, I fill in all over the place, also help out uh, Scalzone Brust with Greg Scalzone Ben Brust uh, weekdays four to six. Uh, fill in there quite a bit as well. So uh, all sorts of stuff, John. But but loving <laughs> loving the loving life here in uh, beautiful awesome. Madison, Wisconsin. And where and where do pe- how do people find you on social media? You're on Twitter. Where else are you? Uh, pretty much, uh, I'm a Twitter guy. I have Facebook. I have Instagram. Don't do a whole lot with them. So at Alex underscore Strofe. Uh, on Twitter is where you can find me and connect with me. Just to expect a lot of sarcasm and, and uh, Packers tweets. And that's S T R O U F Alex Strofe. We'll tag you on some of our posts coming up here, but with all this work that you do, Alex, surely you are well prepared to talk NFL <laughs> draft, right? Oh yeah. You know, I, uh, I was at a bachelor party this weekend in Northern Illinois um, and on the drive back, we stopped at a Walgreens so we, sh- we could all get some ibuprofen to cure our uh, inevitable hangovers, right? So mm-hmm. uh, was, was Keegan with you on this? He, he was not. He was oh, not. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, former uh, 90FM sports director Nathan Hansen, actually, his bachelor party. I don't know if you knew Nathan. Wow, right? okay. Uh, so we were driving back uh, from Illinois, stopped at a Walgreens, and I saw this magazine uh, on the rack, NFL Draft. Uh, from Athlon Sports, and I looked at everybody I was with. I go, holy shit, the NFL drafts on Thursday. I'm way underprepared. <laughs> so I picked this up. I read the wide receiver section, and then I fell asleep because I was hungover. So uh, very prepared, guys. Yes, thank you so much for having me the day before the NFL draft <laughs> and making me look good. Appreciate it. Okay, well, we had a very scientific <laughs> method. We have our hats where oh, we, we picked we, – I, I created 12 scenarios, Alex. <laughs> Uh, of what could okay. possibly happen now the three of us we drew our picks each of us picked trade up uh completely we random chris olave really? drake london and george Karlaftis. and and the thing is is out of those 12 scenarios i only had four trade ups in there so i'm going to have you pick a number between one and 12 and that'll be the scenario that you get what do you like lucky number seven john let's roll with it Lucky number seven. So Alex says that with the 22nd pick overall, the Packers select guard Zion Johnson from Boston College. And with the 28th pick, they take wide receiver Traylon Burks of Arkansas. Okay. That actually isn't a bad scenario. Can the guard I do play say tackle? So because I put them together. <laughs> Can the guard play tackle? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> we need a right tackle, so that would help. But uh, no, I mean, that's good. I love Traylon Burks. That's that's one of my draft crushes. And him at okay. twenty eight, I would be okay with. I think twenty two might be a, a little bit of a reach for him. But if he can provide, I'm good with it. This this wide receiver class is interesting. So, uh, but yeah, I, I I like what I've seen a little bit. Admittedly, I've seen Traylon Burks. I do dig. Yeah, tell tell us why. So what what research have you done on the receivers? Why do you like Burks? Who else do you like? I what like does the Burks. magazine say? Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm going to read it word for word. Um, no, so I, I, this is what I did. This was this is usually my uh, my mo for the draft to do it in four days. Apparently, um, read the magazine, go to YouTube, look up the coolest names. You know who I looked up first? Sky Traylon Moore. Burks. Oh. Almost, Sky Moore was up there. Sky with two Y's threw me yes. off a little bit. Yep. Um, but uh, and Jameson Williams, because I thought the name Jameson was cool, was up there as well. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I like the speed on Traylon Burks. Obviously, didn't play for the best college team in the world, like a, a guy like Jameson Williams or Chris Olave did. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, I like the speed. I like his opportunity to, to, to route run, right? And I mean, I think that's the, the one thing we're going to miss so much about Devontae Adams is because he's the best in the world at route running. Um, you know, he can, he can get open in half a second, uh, less than that. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a skill we're missing with everybody in the wide receiver room right now. And that's something Traylon Burks has. So, uh, but I think a couple of guys in this group have the ability to get open like that. And again, I just, I don't know that anybody with the Packers has that right now. Right. Um, I'm asking here because I don't know. So Traylon Burks, uh, how long was he at Arkansas? Was he a Brett Bielema recruit or is there too much time that passed in between those two? Uh, I don't know either. Uh, I can open the magazine. No, I have a, uh, I have a, <laughs> I have a browser in front of me here. I don't remember uh, when Bielema left Arkansas. So Burks is a junior. So I bet he probably just missed him. Um, probably it would have been, been on a list because, you know, they start looking at these guys in eighth right. grade. That's a good point. So th yeah. there was probably a, some sort of relationship there. Uh, that would be a good press conference question when they draft him with the 28th overall pick because uh, simulation number seven said so. That's right. So you said you <laughs> like Jamison Williams, but now he's got an injury. He's the one yeah. that's injured, right? Yeah, he tore his ACL towards the end of the college season. Um, so obviously yeah. that is a big red flag. Uh, of course, if you want a guy that can, that can pack a punch day one, he wouldn't be able to, you won't get him till maybe November at best. So, right. um, but, but I do think, you know, he's a long-term pick and I don't know that the Packers window is long-term. So I think that's the argument to stay away from him. I think he's a really unique talent and that's why I like him, but I don't know if he's the right answer for the Packers. All right. So Jeff picked Chris Olave from Ohio state and you'll pick Drake London from uh, USC. What do you know about those guys? Yeah, Olave, I, I know more about because he plays in the Big Ten and I cover the Wisconsin Badgers, so I've seen quite a bit of Olave. And, and I mean, he was just money all year, wasn't he? I mean, that's, that, that has been the uh, what I've noticed, and I, I imagine you guys might fall into this club. He has been the guy that Packers Twitter has fallen in love with, right? Everybody on mm -hmm. Twitter and social media has yep. fallen in love with the idea of Chris Olave. Um, so I, I guess that would make Twitter happy because I have a feeling that Twitter might not be very happy after Thursday night. So uh, uh, we will see. Uh, is is yeah. Twitter ever happy though? I mean, <laughs> that, that's, that's an argument we could have for th three yeah. hours, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Probably not is the answer. Um, yeah. I, I know they certainly weren't in 2020 when Brian Gutekunst traded up to get Jordan Love, but that's beside yeah. the point uh, right now, isn't it? Um, yeah, so Olave, I mean, he's a really unique talent. Again, you get the speed, you get the agility, you get the athleticism, not a ton of size, but uh, he, he is, a, 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 I think he would fit in really nicely, um, you know, but I don't know if he'd play more of a slot role. I, I would assume probably not, just given the the, the talent there. So um, who was the other guy again? I'm sorry, Drake London from USC? Yeah. Um, yeah. I've heard more knocks on London. Uh, I just talked to a buddy of mine who, who's really against the idea, whether it's health, whether it's the size doesn't say a whole lot. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what the knocks in him are. And again, I don't know a ton about Drake London. I know he's very high on most draft boards. So uh, it, it's probably a safer pick, right? <laughs> you know, and we can't, you can't do any worse than just picking a name out of a hat or throwing a number. <laughs> right? No, no, you can not Yeah. Yeah. You, I think you guys did pretty good, right? I think, I think yeah. you had a wide receiver on all three of those. I think yep. everybody's yeah, leaving did, happy yeah. if, if well, wide no, receiver. Mine, mine was Karlaftis. I've got Karlaftis trading up for. Oh, it's, yeah, the edge rusher. I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see where Karlaftis goes, right? Like, uh, he, he's a beast. Um, and I, I wonder if he'll be around at 28. I think that's a realistic pick. And, you know, I know he's ranked high, but the mock drafts this year are not going to be right. Uh, they, they're never they're, right. They're never well, right. Just, <laughs> well, they're never right. Yeah. Right. But I mean, that, and that's the fun of them, but I think they're going to be more wrong than ever. Do you guys remember the last draft we had where Wednesday of, we didn't know who the number one pick was. I think Baker Mayfield maybe was the yeah, last draft. Very unusual. Yeah, just, Usually there's kind of a set. Yeah. At least yeah. first two, three. Yeah. yeah. I, I have no idea who's going first tomorrow. Is, is it Kayvon no. Thibodeau? Is it Aiden Hutchinson? I don't know. I, I don't know. So um it's not a quarterback i think we know that i think we know that that's about all we know <laughs> yeah. um so it, this is a fun draft so to, to my point right i think Karloftis could fall he could go as early as 15 and he's one of those big 10 guys too where um you know i'm, I'm intrigued to see where he falls to because he, he was really good this year so dusty last week was talking about he had been seeing the packers taking a shotgun approach and essentially going three picks and hoping that two of them work out what's your vision as far as how many receivers the Packers are actually going to draft this year 
Well, I, I love Dusty. That guy rocks. Um, you know, I got to, I, I've met him a few times. What a wonderful dude. I'm sorry to be such a letdown the week prior. Um, <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but um, yeah, I, I don't know, right? So they have what? I think it's five active receivers right now. Jawan Winfrey's on the border. Um, you know, probably wouldn't make the active roster if they drafted one, right? So I, 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 three is interesting. Does he think one day one, one day two, one day three? Did he give it? Is that what he said? Okay. Um, I could see that happening. I don't think they go three. I think it's more likely they go one wide receiver, a tight end, and uh, maybe a second tight end or a second wide receiver in round seven. That's a flyer. Um, Brian Gutekunst hasn't drafted receivers. He's drafted Amari Rogers and uh, was EQ and, uh, and Jamon Moore. Was that his first draft or was that Ted's last? Do we know off the top of our heads? Um, don't remember. I, it, it was either Ted's last or his first, regardless. Yeah, um, would have been Ted's last. Okay, I, I think you might be right. So, regardless, I, I, like there's just yeah. not very many receivers to Gutekunst's name when 2020 was the year we thought it was all going to be receivers. And, you know, <laughs> nope. at least, at least then we had the, at least then we had the excuse of, well, we've got Devontae Adams. We're fine. Yeah. We don't have that excuse this year. So, I would love to see them pick three wideouts and just hope, hope two of them work out to your point, Neil, and, and to Dusty's point. So, uh, I, I don't think they'll draft three just because I'm a pessimist <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and the collective heart attack that Packer nation will have. If they pick absolutely no wide receivers at all in the draft, it's going to be worse than Jordan love going to be worse yeah. than Jordan love no. yeah. Twitter tomorrow well, night. Like I said, after tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, when the first round is done, if the Packers haven't taken a wide receiver, it's going to be just a bloodbath. Oh yeah. But, do you really well, think it's, it's do you really think it's gonna be that bad given that you know there are a lot of receivers who are you know decent but are not rated with a first round grade? I mean well, we're talking about Twitter here, remember. So this is but I, I maybe, mean I would be fine. Jeff, I Jeff, maybe, be like, Jeff, maybe need, you need to follow better people on Twitter. Right? You're, you're supposed to follow reasonable people. If you're following people that make you angry, you're following the wrong no, no, people. No, no, no. Of course, Jeff, but my, follow- my point is is that I think the collective is that the, the expectation is that a wide receiver will be taken. So if one yeah. doesn't get taken, then yeah, it would it would be bananas. I, I have a hard time believing that would be the case. I think they have to pick one in the first three rounds, first two days. Yeah. Uh, but to Neil's Neil, I got to respond about your Twitter comment first. Uh, I, I always refer on our show. You can follow us on the cesspool we call Twitter, right? I don't think you can follow you can follow three people. Twitter is still gonna piss you off. So <laughs> <laughs> that's just what it's designed for. I think I love it. Um, but anyway, yeah. Caught me mid olive there. I, I, I mid olive, <laughs> green olive or black olive? Please say green. Green, obviously. I'm having a martini, my friend. Classy, John. Yeah. Classy. I'm yeah, right. trying to keep it classy tonight. You know. Just, yeah. You can only hope. Straight, straight gin. It's the uh, Ryan Reynolds Aviation Gin, which is how is that? I like Thumbs it. Up. It's it's pretty smooth. Yeah. Good for Ryan yeah. Reynolds. Similarly to him, he's also very smooth. He is. He's yeah. a nice looking kid, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he sure is. He, if. If if there was a movie about Ryan Reynolds, Alex, you could play it. Uh, nah, nah, I couldn't. Wow. I'm, not, I'm not even nearly <laughs> that handsome, John. I really appreciate that compliment. I might uh, I might add that to my Twitter bio, right? Like, yeah, there we somebody go. Ryan, once told yeah. me I could play Ryan Reynolds in a movie. No, or the I, other way around. Let's, 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 let's just so say this though: John definitely beer goggles anyone from UWSP. Though, so. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. That's right. Yeah, so. You went to the right school. You're a good man. Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the other thing I was going to say, we, we, we're talking offense a lot, uh, going to the other side of the ball, going to the defense, and really the two players that I think I like a lot um, are just the two big men from Georgia, Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt, and just putting another big body next to Kenny Clark. I know they brought in Jaron Reed. Um, we're hoping TJ Slayton still you know, develops, but boy, what, what about putting another massive 300 and some pounds uh, right up there next to Kenny Clark with a young guy with fresh legs. Yeah, D- Davis uh, stole the pro day, didn't he? Or the combine. I mean, he was yeah. he was phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I I would be okay with it, right? Like, I think adding another body to your point, John, to the defensive line is definitely an appealing thought because I don't think Jaron Reed is a, is a Hall of Famer, right? So um, I I would be fine with taking a shot. The the thing is. You know, I, I'm still torn because I, I constantly say there's this misconception in, in terms of wide receivers that you can actually go find a guy that's going to provide and, and contribute day one. I just, it's so rare. 
And you've got some more examples in the last several years. Obviously, the, the big two being Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. But you've got other guys that had decent rookie years, like Terry McLaurin, you know, that was a, a second round pick. So um, I, I just, I think we need to pump the brakes on that. So maybe your route of right going big man from Georgia, one of the two that you've fallen in love with, uh, isn't a horrible idea, right? Like Jordan Davis, like I said, he stole the freaking combine. And, and mm-hmm. Trayvon Walker is one of the better defensive linemen, defensive linemen in this class. And that's a pretty deep class too. So uh, I'd be okay with it, but it's like, I got to see what the trade is then because they're not following the 22 probably. Okay. Um, I mean, there's, I just have no idea how this is going to go. So this might sound absolutely ridiculous come Friday, but um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't know that either of them fall the 22. I think Jordan Davis is, is going to have somebody that fell in love with his pro day or his combine day. I keep calling it a pro day. Uh, fall in love with that and, and pick him at, you know, 12, yeah. you know, it's just, you never know how this stuff's going to go, but I, I wouldn't think- be against it. Yeah, I think probably what's going to happen, and this has happened in some drafts too when it's kind of wide open like this, that you're going to see teams, you're going to get kind of that group think going where you're going to, somebody's going to take somebody and they're like, oh God, we got to like fall in line. The dominoes, and there's going to be yeah. the, the, you know, people are going to like draft crazy. Then there's going to be really goofy shit happen because then there will be trades. There will be not the, you know, giving up all your draft picks for somebody that they, you know, somebody really wants, but then there's going to be, I think it's going to be entertaining from that aspect, because I, I think there will be these, these runs, these kind of weird group thinks, and that will force teams to do stupid shit. Let me turn that on you then, right? So let's say the wide receiver hall starts at nine and then you get another one at 11 and then 12 and then 14 mm-hmm. as a Packers fan. What are you thinking in that moment? We got to fucking move. Actually, no, I'm thinking, well, let it happen okay. you know, because it's, it's, I mean, there, there's no right or wrong answer. Right. But it, it's still, if you, if you've got, if you want to stick to what you've got, right. If you want to say, okay, we've got, you know, just if it's not a receiver. So again, maybe we've got, you know, big body in the middle, we've got somebody on the defense that we really want or, or that causes, you know, somebody a tackle or somebody on the offensive line to fall. Yeah. Sweet. I mean, that's how we, well, that's how we got Aaron Rodgers, right? I mean, you could argue that, you know, goofy shit happens. Somebody that's supposed to be picked isn't and drops. And then, you know, a team takes advantage of it. Somebody just falls in your lap. Right. I am of the same opinion, right? We've got five picks in the top 100 and let's get somebody good at all five of them. And whoever falls into those right positions, let's choose those people. I, um, you know, Drafting up uh, is sometimes works and it often doesn't. And it seems to not work more often than it works. Well, so I've got a question for everyone. So over and under for trades in the first round, I'm going to put the number at six over and under. You mean tomorrow? Under. Yeah. Just tomorrow first round. Trades. Just the first round. A good number oh, to boy. pick there, Neil. Uh, um, I was just about yeah. to say, <laughs> I, I think that's the number. Now, yeah. Now you call it, yeah, you're calling it five and a half or you're calling it six and a half? Because I think, yeah, six is probably the number five. I have, five trades seems reasonable. I'll go five. I'll, tell, I'll play Neil's game. He's putting it at six. I'll go over. I think there, I think there could be seven. I think we're going to have a lot of movement tomorrow. Um, and, and to Jeff's earlier point, right, where the dominoes start falling, we go on these little runs positionally. There's a lot of teams with the same need this year, right? I think we could rattle off 10 teams that need a real wide receiver um, or, or, or could use one, right? So um, I, I'll go over just for the fun of the game. Right. Yeah, I, I will too. And I think – and it it is – interesting too because there it's kind of the haves and the have nots too because there's a number of teams that don't have a number one pick that are going to be kind of sol regardless but then there's the packers you know there's kansas city there's there's multiple teams with multiple first round picks all of a sudden so then how is that going to play out as well so that's why i'm going to take the over as well all right so we got that on record alex you kind of mentioned it as well the freshness date on this podcast is really less than 24 hours right so we got to rely on neil's <laughs> editing skills to get this uh, in the can yet tonight so that we can get it out there and people can enjoy it uh leading up into the draft the other thing alex uh, i want to get your mom's email address so that we can send her to the link for this because uh, our moms listen and they let us know how often we, we use the f-bomb 
Uh, so we want to make sure your mom is uh, on board with this as well. Okay? Sufficiently, uh, yeah. I, I, I was just about to say, John, you're married, aren't you? Uh, so, uh, it, the funny thing is, is I think your mom is our age, too. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's in her mid-50s. So, yeah. I mean, probably in the ballpark. Uh, yeah. We're, yeah, we're all 52. Uh, uh, oh, well, yeah, she's yeah, you, you just about. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, Mom. I'll just say that much. Sorry, sorry, for, sorry for dropping one. It's Jeff's right. fault. He dropped the shit, and then I dropped the fuck. <laughs> yep, there you go. It's always to, my fault. It's always way, my fault. Way to give us the scorecard on that. Yeah. Mark would be happy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so quick look here. The Bucks are up 19 right now. Alex, j just tell us real quick what's going on with the Bucks season. How are they going to finish out here after taking care of the Bulls? What's up next? Bo yeah. Boston? Yeah, it's the Boston Celtics, and that will likely start uh, start Sunday is what I'm hearing. But, uh, of course, that's subject to change. Hopefully, I'll look smart on, uh, on Thursday, according to Neil's <laughs> editing skills. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, it'll be Boston likely this weekend or early next week. Uh, they're the best defensive team in the league, and the Bucs are down, debatably, their second-best player in Chris Middleton for – likely the foreseeable future he'll be reevaluated here in about a week uh due to a sprained mcl so uh they turned it on the last three games i mean as we speak they're up 19 in the fourth quarter it's looking pretty good the last two games they've throttled the bulls celtics are a lot better than the bulls but the uh what's the saying in in the avengers we we have a hulk right we have, uh, a, hulk. We yeah. have a Giannis, uh yep. which the boston <laughs> celtics do not have so uh, I think it's going to be the best series of the NBA playoffs, and the winner of that series is going to the finals. I guarantee it because the six. Who do you like out of Who do you like out of the West? I love the Warriors. I think they're they're okay. they're they're hitting their stride at the right time. Jordan Poole, Milwaukee represent. Uh, he's he's just come on like crazy, especially in the the first few games of their uh, opening round series. So I, I would love to see a Steph versus Giannis finals, man. That would be a blast. Okay. So Alex is calling Bucks Warriors in the NBA finals. I I think it's a rematch. I think it's the Bucks Suns going down at. Uh, down at it again this year uh, it, it'll be interesting to see because the suns uh it seems like they're going to get devin booker back now but uh he, he went down with a with a nasty injury as well early so it'll yeah. be interesting to see what percentage we get of him um but i wouldn't doubt it i mean the suns have been terrific all year uh you know but their identity is a little lost without booker but it looks like they may still get him back this series so i uh, don't think it's a bad pick but uh neil if i get that wrong would you mind editing that out <laughs> Well, I mean, we're going to edit, edit retrospectively at this point because we got a ways <laughs> to go. Uh. <laughs> yes. All right. Alex, any words of wisdom before we head out of here? Uh, don't lose your minds. Everything will be all right. I believe Aaron Rodgers said it in 2014. R-E-L-A-X. Relax. All right. All right. Words Alex, of thanks wisdom. for joining us. We'll, we'll get the links up on, on Twitter to let everybody know where to find you, where to find the podcast. We really appreciate you coming in and uh, have a good night. It was fun, guys. Appreciate it. I didn't right. finish my Thank River West Stein. Sorry for, for uh, not drinking as fast as yep. John did with his uh, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds martini. <laughs> Th Thank you, Alex. Cheers, guys. <laughs> and certainly as we're talking about the current NFL draft, we want to take a look at one of our Packer players of the past and maybe where they fell in a historic NFL draft. Maybe the not the 199th pick, Neil, but the 200th pick overall, one Brian Bartlett star what do you got for us Bart star the draft prospect and you know what what would his numbers have looked like and you know was he you know a reach for the Packers was he somebody that we you know got had lucky to fall to us so uh, Bart star as, as most Packers fans know is from originally from Montgomery Alabama uh, he didn't actually start playing football in high school until his sophomore year and um, after two days in football he decided that he was going to quit his dad said, well, you can quit and work in the family garden or you can go back to football. He went back to football. His junior, <laughs> year, his junior in high school, he uh, started as quarterback and his team went undefeated. His senior year in high school, he was an all-state, all-American quarterback. Um, was recruited nationally, uh, included at, including at the University of Kentucky by Bear Bryant, the coach then at Kentucky. Um, but he chose to go to Alabama because his girlfriend, Sherry, happened to be located in Alabama. She was going to Auburn, and so he wanted to be near her. So his Freshman year, uh, 1952 at Alabama, uh, he was mostly a backup. He also punted and he also played uh, defensive back. So just as, as at the time, you know, we talked about Don Hudson in his multiple positions. Uh, Bart Starr also uh, played multiple positions while he was at Alabama. Uh, he was mostly a, a backup. He did uh, over the year, he was 17 for 29, 170 yards passing, no touchdowns, three interceptions. But in the Orange Bowl, he, uh, he was able to play, and he was 8 of 12, 93 yards passing and a touchdown um, as Alabama finished the year number nine in the country. 
um, with a win over Syracuse. And specifically, in his freshman year, he also got a receiving touchdown, his only reception of his entire college career. His sophomore year, uh, he was in a position now to start to make a little bit more of an impact. And so uh, Alabama, his sophomore year, went 6-3-3. Three, and three. Um, As a quarterback, he was 59 of 119 with eight touchdowns and six interceptions and a 7.3 yard per attempt. Um, so somebody was starting to show talent as a quarterback. Um, and specifically, uh, he went to the Cotton Bowl where he lost 20. He and the Alabama uh, Crimson Tide lost to Rice 28-6. Um, and notably, uh, his, his, uh, Alabama is, there's only one team that they have ever played that they've never beaten. And that is Rice University. Um, one wow. of those losses against, uh, against Bart Starr or, or with Bart Starr against Rice. Um, so a major component of his college occurred between his sophomore and junior. And there were two things that came to play first, um, he and, and Cherry eloped. Um, and it, it was important that they eloped at that time because, during those, that period, uh, college players were discouraged from marrying, and they specifically would have uh, their scholarships revoked, revoked in case of getting married. And so wow. it was something that they kept entirely uh, away from other people in order to make sure that he could keep his scholarship. But there was a secondary element that, came, that happened between his sophomore and junior year, such that when he started his junior year, he had a mysterious back injury. And it appeared to be something that was a minor injury, but it is something that was recurring and caused him to not play very much his junior year. Um, and as it turns out, it was not. A, and so the, the way it was described in the press at the time was that it was a punting injury. He injured himself while punting, doing punting practice. It was a back injury of some sort, but he would, you know, started out the season on shorts and didn't play most of the games. Uh, overall in the year, he was only 24 of 41 as far as passing is concerned. As it turns out, the actual reason wasn't revealed by Bart Starr until about 50 years after his time in Alabama. You know, it was actually a hazing injury. So the, the A club at the University of Alabama was the, the club for varsity athletes. And they had a hazing ritual in which they would paddle all of the new inductees with these big wooden paddles with, uh, with holes in them. And so he was injured so much in that, in that paddling, in that hazing incident that his, his back was raw all the way top to bottom. Um, he had uh, a back injury that fundamentally affected him the entire rest of his life. And um, recovering from that back injury was something that essentially took away his entire junior year. Um, he was in traction for a week in the middle of October just because of recurrences from the, the back injury and the hospital in traction. Um, so he fundamentally lost an entire year of his college career to hazing. And during that year, Arkansas went four, five, and two. It was only the second losing season for Arkansas in the last 50 years. Al and Alabama at Alabama, sorry, only losing a uh, second losing season for Alabama in the last 50 years. And the head coach who had championed Bart Starr resigned at the end of that year. And the, the head coach at the time, uh, wherever I have his name, uh, Harold Drew, Her yeah, Harold Drew said that uh, Bart Starr was the best uh, throwing best quarterback, but the best passer in Alabama history at that time. Um, and wow. yet, you know, they, they lost all these games because fundamentally their quarterback couldn't play. And they had another player who was also out with injuries for the entire year. So Bart Starr's senior year now is, you know, he's going to try to go back to what he had done as a, as a sophomore. They installed a new head coach and that new head coach at Alabama, um, specifically uh, Jennings Whitworth was somebody who decided that he wanted a running game and he wanted a youth movement and he was gonna do things his way. And so fundamentally, if you were a senior on that Alabama team, you were not going to play a whole lot. And uh, he went for a running game. Um, as it turns out, that was not so successful. Alabama was zero and 10 in that oh. 1955 year. Um, <laughs> and Alabama, those following two years was two seven and one and two seven and one. He lasted three years at Alabama. Uh, Bear Bryant followed him up, but Alabama, the three worst years in Alabama's history, starting with uh, Bart wow. Starr's senior year of being zero and oh. 10. Yeah, Her Harold Drew and Jennings Whitworth are the Lyle Blackburn and Scooter McLean of Alabama coaches, just miserable Oof. years, and then Bear Bryant comes in, same with... And with made it so, all go away. Anyway, so, yeah. so Bart Starr's senior year, uh, he was 55 of 96, 587 yards, one touchdown pass, nine interceptions. The Ooh. team, the team only scored 48 
points the entire season. This was a terrible team, <laughs> but Bart did get to practice one yard runs for touchdowns, something that became uh, especially of his, as it turns out, when he was a professional. That turned so, out pretty well. So if we look at Bart Starr's entire college career, 155 of, of uh, 285, 54%, not bad for the time, 1,900 yards passing, 10 touchdowns, 20 interceptions. And then his rushing numbers are somehow even worse. Um, he had 123 rushes for negative 56 yards for a negative half yard <laughs> per rush. Now, obviously, some of those are actually going to be sacks uh, because sacks weren't counted separately at the time. But um, negative 56 yards career as far as his rushing is concerned. And so I would argue that Bart Starr being chosen with the 200th pick and being chosen the 17th round was generous. This was a case where if you look at his college stats, there was really nothing to go on that suggested that he was going to be a professional quarterback. Um, but we're back into the whole thing of Jack Venice. And, you know, the people down at Alabama said, this is somebody who you should take a look at. This is somebody who is capable of being somebody. And um, it took a while, you know, it was five years before he started for the Packers. It was very much a draft and develop. Um, but that flyer in the 17th round, obviously something that, that was monumentally important as far as Packers history. Well, one of the one of the first questions you asked is if the Packers reached to get him and at the 200th pick <laughs> overall, absolutely not. Uh, and then even say that he, he fell to them. And you're right. I think those last two years at Alabama certainly uh, played against him. But Johnny D, the basketball coach there at Alabama, friends with Jack Finisi, uh, who made the recommendation. But the, then then you get him to Green Bay. And the cards are stacked against him. Tobin Roth is the starting quarterback when he comes in. Roth leaves. And he was Babe a high Perilli. pick. Yeah. Yeah. Babe Perilli comes back to Green Bay. And then when Lombardi shows up, Lombardi says, boy, I need, I need a, an established quarterback. And he brings Lamar McCann into Green Bay. You know, so Bart uh, really persevered through some, some rough years there before becoming the legend that he is or was or is. So, like I said, too, the the not the 199th pick, but the 200th pick overall. Neil, that, that that's that's got to be something when you look at kind of Hall of Fame numbers where people were drafted and things like that. Tom Brady 199, Bart Starr 200. But really, Jeff, you kind of have our our story on that about not players where they were drafted, but maybe whether they were undrafted. So, for our history lesson, here's Jeff's bedtime story. All right. So, this was a little bit more difficult task than I originally had thought. I just kind of want to take a look at, okay, who are the undrafted and how many undrafted um, players are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? And uh, going out to the interwebs kind of raised more questions than anything else. Um, so a lot of cross-referencing was done. Um, and after a fair amount of research, um, I've come up with 19 undrafted players are, are currently in the NFL Hall of Fame. Um, that's 19 out of many, many, many thousands, tens of thousands of players that have suited up for a game. So who were these people and kind of, you know, or who were these men and, and how did they, you know, why were they undrafted? So um, I do have the list of 19. Um, I'm going to quickly kind of go through the names, but one thing that emerges is that a lot of them were good football players. They weren't drafted because um, in the 40s, they were serving in World War II. So that's kind of initially what happened. So some of these, these players that turned out to be actually Hall of Fame players were not drafted because they were serving the country. So um, um, early on, the undrafted players were, were more, weren't the skill positions, if you will. So they were, you know, on the line, they were centers, they were defensive linemen, things like that. It, interesting, it, it isn't until later, like in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, that we have some quarterbacks that were undrafted that, you know, so it's like you think, oh, the draft is, you know, this, it's progressed and things like that. You know what, it's way better, obviously, than it was back in the 30s and 40s when it was just really fledgling, but yet, there are our names and you'll recognize them of, of players that weren't drafted. So in no particular order. Uh, so Frank Gatsky was a center. He played 12 seasons with the Browns and the lions. And all of these men were, were actually instrumental you know, for the Browns and the lions when they had successes in the forties and the fifties. So Jack Butler quarter uh, cornerback with Pittsburgh. Um, he played throughout the fifties, Jim Langer. He was a center. He played with the Dolphins and the Vikings. Now, 
I'll mention the Vikings here, but the Vikings crop up a lot, interestingly enough, on undrafted players that played for them that are in the Hall of Fame. Actually, uh, the Lions share, no pun intended, because there are a few Lions as well. Uh, Bill Wills, defensive lineman, Cleveland Browns. Uh, this name, obviously, for Packer fans, very familiar. Willie Wood, safety, played 12 seasons for the Packers. Uh, Larry Little, guard for the uh, the Dol- San Diego Originally signed with them as a free agent, and he was traded to the Dolphins, and he was he was a major part of that uh, Dolphins undefeated team. And actually, there was a number of linemen that were undrafted um, for that perfect season of 73. Um, so we've got Joe Perry. Um, he played for 16 seasons from 1948 to 1963, kind of that same wartime uh Mick Tinglehoff, that's a big uh, Vikings, uh, he was the center. He played 17 seasons for the Vikings. Um, others include um, Emmett uh, Thomas. He played exclusively 13 seasons for the Kansas City Chiefs at cornerback. Um, Marion Motley, nine seasons um, bet- uh, with uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh, again, starting in the 40s. Uh, 46 to 53. Uh, Willie Brown, he famously, he's in a lot of the, he made the interception in one of the Super Bowls and run, ran it back 75 yards. Uh, cornerback for, for Oakland. Um, John Randall. Now, here we get somebody that's a little more recent. Remember him? He and Favre always would have their, their duels on the field. So John Randall, defensive tackle, 14 seasons from 1990 to 2003 mostly with the Vikings, but also with the Seahawks. Here's another Packer, and he was really, he he found his fame with the Giants, but he also played and was very instrumental with Vince Lombardi in helping to recruit um, players to play for Green Bay, Emlyn Tunnel, safety. So 14 seasons from 1948 to 61. Now, interesting, couple interesting notes. Um, He is the first African-American that was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1967 and the first primary defensive back. Then we have um, Kurt Warner. Remember Kurt? Now mm-hmm. he was on the Packers practice squad, as I recall, in the, in the early 90s. Um, so Kurt has a very interesting distinction. So, um, so he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame but he's the only player to be in another Hall of Fame. Can you gotta name it? The, it's got to be the Arena Football League. Very good. Yep, very yeah. good. Only player, Arena Football Hall of Fame and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Wow. So then we have Lou Groza, um, the toe. So he played, uh, he was an offensive tackle and then finished his uh, career as a kicker. With <laughs> He played 21 seasons wow. in Cleveland. Then we have Warren Moon. Now, what's interesting about Warren is that he was an excellent quarterback in college, but nobody picked him. So he said, all right, I'm going to take my talents to Canada. And he went and he won. uh, He proceeded to win five straight Grey Cups in the CFL with Edmonton. And then the NFL went, oh, maybe he's not that bad. And had he played, so he played 17 seasons in the NFL. Had he played... You know, if the CFL stats would count or if, again, if he was over 20 years in the NFL, he would probably hold most of the records even today. Well, well, but Uh, he is also he's also in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame as well. Yes. Yep. I I would assume I don't know that for sure, but I'm assuming since he won five straight great cops. I I guess I'm assuming I'm telling you he he is (laughs) fabulous. Um, So then we have Drew Pearson, uh, wide receiver, played 11 seasons for the Cowboys. Uh, another cowboy, Cliff Harris, uh, who played um, in the '70s, also for the Cowboys, and arguably one of the one of the better uh, nicknames, Dick Night Train Lane. Night Train Lane, undrafted. He played 14 seasons with the Rams, the Chicago Cardinals, and he has most success with the Detroit Lions. So again, m- a lot of these players, 40s, 50s, kind of into the 60s. Hardly anybody. Well, I shouldn't say that. There, there were a few players in the 70s, almost nobody in the 80s. Now, here's an interesting short list of players that are either playing today or recently retired 
that were undrafted that probably will end up in the Hall of Fame. Right. Adam Vinatieri, undrafted. Yep. James Harrison. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Antonio Gates. Yeah, okay. And Jason Peters, the offensive All right. tackle. All right. And and the other thing, too, with your, your list, Jeff, realize, remember, we talked about this last week, that the NFL draft starts in 1936. So mm-hmm. this doesn't take into effect players in the first 16, 17 years of the NFL because none of those guys were drafted. Right, you know, exactly. The, Johnny the, Blood McNally wasn't the drafted. Curly Lambos, exactly. Curly Lambo yeah. wasn't drafted. So this is really uh, players in the draft era undrafted. So really, yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that goes without saying that you don't have to be drafted to be a good player. You know, we mm-hmm. through Green Bay have seen our share of undrafted players. We had a, a very long streak of undrafted players making that opening day roster yeah. here in Green Bay. So yeah, we'll we'll find our picks here in the next couple of days, but it's Sunday night and Monday where we may find some gems as well that exactly. hopefully stick, stick around and make the team there as well. So I want to add one more thing. So also on the Pro Football Hall of Fame website, so it has draft teams. So in other words, the teams that drafted the most Hall of Fame players. Now, I couldn't quite figure out the criteria because so the Steelers came in at, at 16. So I don't know. So I'm guessing that those are that's the the number of players that they drafted that ultimately became Hall of Fame players because there's there's they're the highest at 16. So then the Bears are have 15, and then there's a three way tie: the Cowboys, Lions, and Packers all at 13, and then the Giants and the Browns at 10. Yeah. So this is the draft team for the Hall of Fame players so kind of an interesting so in other words teams sometimes draft players that and they let them go you know i mean they're even the undrafted folks that were signed they played a year or two for a team they were traded or they they left and went to another team and that's where they found their hall of fame success so it's ultimately it's a crapshoot it is do your homework you hope for the best and, and picking out of a hat does just as well. So let's recap our picks. Alex, our guest tonight, he he ended up with Zion Johnson and Traylon Burks being his picks. I'm trading up for George Karlaftis. Neil was Drake London. Yes. And Jeff had Chris Olave. And you guys are yep. comfortable with those. And Neil, what was the other bet? How many trades are going to happen? Trades. Over under, over under six was six. Half. six. Yeah. Did you ever I say what you five. are, John? Yeah, I said, I, I think there's going to be five because it's okay. 10 teams. Five trades is 10 teams. That, that, that seems like a lot to me. All right. All right. All right, gentlemen, anything else before we get out of here? No, we got kind of a, a short production week, and then uh, we're, we're back uh, sooner than later. We are going to throw together a show on Sunday post-draft to talk about everything we got right and wrong about this one. Neil, <laughs> like I said earlier, the editing skills are up to you to get this one in the can so that there is some freshness to it before the draft on Thursday night. All right, everyone, you can get information on the GB podcast at Green Bay Chat on Twitter and on Facebook at the GBC podcast, Green Bay Chat. We always emphasize that we are not the German Baptist Church. And as usual, may you fully appreciate the magnitude of your impending good fortune. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night.